All right, if everyone can start to get resettled, we'll go ahead and get started with our next presentation. All right, as everybody is getting settled again, I will introduce you to Dr. Akira Shishido. I am so excited that he agreed to come and talk with us today. Um, he's got quite a group of slides to show you. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Shishido. Currently, he is the Associate Medical Director at the Department of Cl Clinical Development for Infectious Disease at BioNTech, which is um, a remote position through Cambridge, Massachusetts. Another Cambridge, uh, was, um, Dr. Dillingham went to Harvard, so I was like, I love the campus, but anyway, um, he's also the Associate Editor for the Journal of Special Operations Man Medicine. And most recently, he was um, worked infectious disease at the Virginia Commonwealth University, and that's how I got put in touch with Dr. Shishido. Um, he got his medical de degree at Harvard as well, and then um, he did his internal medicine residency at the National Capital Consortium in Bethesda, and then did an infectious disease fellowship at the University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore. He's had multiple faculty positions with Virginia Commonwealth University, the University of Maryland School, School of Medicine, as well as the Uniform Services University School of Medicine. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Akira Shishido. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, ah, I see. Appreciate it. Perfect. And everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. And I should have asked this before. I'm so sorry, but can we just make sure the doors are closed um, here? Just hopefully there's not a fire, but everything will be fine. Okay. All right. So I'll be discussing MPOX diagnosis and treatment. Uh, a couple of disclosures to get out of the way. Uh, just, I did receive financial support initially as I was a PI for the STOMP trial. Um, I'm no longer that because I'm not at VCU anymore. Uh, I do work for BioNTech now, which is a vaccine company that they actually are developing an MPOX vaccine, um, but I will not be discussing MPOX vaccines as part of this uh, talk here. Another disclosure, uh, there are some explicit images. So that's why I ask the doors to be closed here. Um, all images were obtained and are being presented with the patient consent um, or have been previously published. So just to uh, start us off, I'm going to start with a case here. And this is probably a familiar type of case is familiar to at least some of you, at least how it starts out. So a 28 year old man presents uh, for care complaining of painful genital lesions. He's got a history of uncontrolled HIV. Uh, MPOX is diagnosed by a PCR swab from these lesions and he started on TPOX, which was acquired through CDC um, expanded access program. And just to show this is the um, genital lesions by the time he kind of presented to our care. Uh, moving on, genital uh, lesions worsened and the patient developed disseminated lesions across his body. Uh, vaccinia IVIG was obtained from the CDC and administered. Brincidif Vir also is obtained from the CDC and administered. ART was initiated. However, despite this, the lesions continue to progress and worsen. So that's kind of as they're progressing, a couple weeks um, progression to his genital lesions, disseminating lesions through his hand. Um, you'll kind of see see the best way to point here. So these are kind of, these are scabbed over and you could argue that some of them are hearing, but however, uh, he's also developing these new lesions uh, concurrently while these other ones are scabbing over here. Same thing on his uh, feet as well. And uh, his face is starting to kind of coalesce into a big S scar as well. So we will come back to him, um, but just wanted to kind of introduce some of the more severe manifestations that we've seen here in Virginia. Uh, I'll just briefly review pathogenesis. I, I suspect this may have been talked about a little bit before. Uh, talk about the clinical manifestations, diagnosis, which is testing, uh, and then go through an overview of the treatment and some severe cases uh, with lessons learned at the end. So pathogenesis, this is a viral life cycle slide. This is not a basic science talk, so don't worry, but um, Basically, this is a double-stranded DNA virus. Oh, nice. Okay, double-stranded DNA virus uh, that will bind and enter many cells. So the primary cells that they'll infect will be epithelial cells, which is why they get in through um, the genitals, through the mouth. Um, but it can also just directly infect skin as well. Uh, fuses, releases its contents into the cytoplasm. DNA replication in the cytoplasm. I should mention here that the entire life cycle is in the cytoplasm. 
Um, and we'll look at the slide again just to highlight some of the countermeasures here that I'm highlighting. Uh, but once the DNA replicates, it's transcribed in mRNA. The mRNA uh, is translated into proteins. The viruses are assembled here and then bud out. All right. And so this process, uh, as I mentioned, happens in the epithelial cells, but also skin cells directly can be infected. Uh, there's then viral replication uh, locally at the site of infection. Uh, but then it migrates actually through dendritic cells, uh, which are spread throughout the tissue, antigen presenting cells uh, into regional lymph nodes. And that's how you get the lymphadenopathy uh, kind of near the initial site of infection, at least initially. Uh, and then you actually do get a viremia with this. The virus is not freely uh, floating in the blood. It's actually through these um, antigen presenting cells, infected white blood cells uh, traveling through the bloodstream, uh, but there is actually a period of viremia. And the viremia is then how it gets disseminated into multiple organs. Uh, you get, you know, the lesions on the hands, feet, genitals, mouth, um, disseminated across the body for that. Incubation period is uh, around seven days, but up to 21. And I, I suspect that it's actually it can be even shorter, at least in this uh, clade 2B uh, outbreak that we've seen. And, um, you know, classically we uh, taught, or we were, we were taught that there was a prodrome of just fever malaise, um, but that seemed to be absent in a significant number of the patients that we've seen in the most recent outbreak here. Uh, the lesions then progress from macules, papules, to fluid filled vesicles. Uh, into pustules uh, that with a little dimple in the center that eventually will scab over. Um, and once the scab falls off, that's when patients are considered recovered and no longer infectious. Uh, I should say that in addition to these processes happening, uh, it can spread um, you know, to multiple body sites as we saw uh, to include um, you know, proctitis, urethritis, encephalitis, but also organ systems to include the GI tract, respiratory tract, and um, the uh, central nervous system. So these are some pictures of uh, lesions in mild cases. Uh, they look um, essentially like clinically indistinguishable in my uh, opinion from molluscum, which is another pox virus, probably the most common pox virus. Uh, oops. And these are the uh, histologic Findings. Uh, I'm not a pathologist, but I will tell you that the main findings are that they show epi epithelial cell necrosis. So just a lot of dead cells and there's viral inclusions um, in some of these infected cells that are not yet dead uh, that are called guanyri bodies, which are pathognomonic for pox virus infections. Uh, lastly, this is just highlighting that there's actually uh, vessel involvement. So this is a blood vessel found in the tissue that's also involved. And uh, you'll see this lymphocytic cell infiltration. So lymphocytes are stained with a brown dye here. Uh, and that's what's being shown is that uh, these blisters are uh, infiltrated with lymphocytes. So clinical manifestations and diagnosis. Um, I put this slide in here because I wasn't sure exactly who, uh, who would actually be at this meeting. Um, so obviously, you know, I think there's some infectious disease folks here, um, public health folks here, but this is, Early on in the outbreak, not every patient is going to be presenting to a sexual health clinic or an ID clinic. Um, significant number presented directly to the emergency department, primary care, derm clinic, other hospital clinics. I'll mention OBGYN as well, um, as well as urology. So um, it, it's not just STI clinics and ID clinics that these patients are presenting to. So clinical features, uh, primarily rash located hands, feet, chest, mouth, near the genitals. Uh, and they can be subtle. We'll look at some more pictures of this, but they can really just look like pimples or blisters initially. Um, classically, we're taught that they're very painful, which most of the time they are, but they can also be itchy um, and, and less painful. Uh, and then patients may also have this um, prodrome with the fever, chills, fatigue, but that may or may not be uh, present. And in healthy patients, this is a self-limited illness that lasts about a month. Um, but as we will see in patients uh, with um, incomplete immunity definitely can do worse. Differential diagnosis, of course, is anything that can create uh, an ulcer or a blister, uh, which would include things like syphilis, chancroid, herpes, uh, and um, other herpes viruses. So here's some of the more subtle lesions. Um, this is, I think this was from a New England Journal paper, 
uh, but you'll see that they literally just kind of look like almost like chicken pox here or even just pimples. This is a very subtle lesion. And the only reason we knew that this was a clinically significant lesion at all is because he had, he was already diagnosed with MPOX from more severe lesions elsewhere. But, but this was a, a tender lesion on the hand that we picked up um, later on in the clinic visit. More pictures here. So this is kind of more vesicular lesion uh, that can look like a pimple, um, similar to here. This has that central umbilication or dimple that looks a little bit more like molluscum. And then these are kind of scab lesions that have scabbed over, but these are all MPOX lesions. Oral lesions. So uh, early, earlier on, I actually gave a, a, a talk to um, a dental uh, society just because um, they invited me, but also I figured it was important because patients are going to be coming in and uh, either may have something like this and not even mention it, or may actually go to a dentist for um, an oral lesion. Um, and so this looks definitely could look for passes basically anything um, HSV or an apis ulcer um, and then there's some more subtle kind of uh, this could all this almost looks like an exudate but these are just white plaques that appear in the back posterior oropharynx uh, multiple more examples of lesions some more subtle than others so the CDC put out case definitions for MPOX um, that I, I'm presenting here and I, I will just say that um, while I think it was uh, more helpful to have, I would say, restrictive criteria of who we're testing and not early on when testing was uh, sparse, when we didn't have as many resources, I would say that have a low threshold to test. Um, because if we're continuing to really only look for this infection in um, patients that are, are in a very slim category, then we're only going to continue to find infections in that small category of patients. So. Now that we have more expanded access to testing, I would have a very low threshold to test. So how do we test? So uh, originally it was all dry swabs that we were doing, but now it's these, um, it's the universal viral transport media. It's the pink fluid in the, in the red top tube with a, uh, with a synthetic um, swab, specifically not a cotton swab. And um, DCLS, Virginia State Lab offers it, but there's also multiple commercial labs that are, that are now offering the testing as well. Uh, which has allowed us for expanded access here. Uh, as what came up before, I'll say that uh, you are technically supposed to wear PPE, which includes, um, you know, the N95 respirator, full gown and gloves and eye protection. Uh, you know, what will happen, uh, and I, I, I'm not sure if this was the question before, but this has happened in our clinic, is that someone will present to the clinic, not have obvious lesions or not tell anyone, and, uh, you know, you're in there doing your assessment and everything. And then halfway through the exam, they're like, you know what? I got to show you this thing. And it's something very impressive blossoming somewhere. And the whole time you haven't had any PPE on. I will say that, you know, we do our best about, you know, realistic uh, expectations of what to do. I'll say anecdotally that this, is ha this happened at least probably 10 times in our clinic. And, um, you know, fortunately, no healthcare provider ever contracted the infection. Um, but once you know about it, I would say go ahead and put all that stuff on. It probably is, um, you know, out of an abundance of caution that that's the guidance. But um, you know, when you go home and, and kiss your family at night, you don't you don't want to think that you may have jeopardized <laughs> bringing something home. Um, so just just to clarify, if there's any question about that, it, that does happen, but we just do our best. There have been no cases of uh, healthcare transmission um, because of something like that. Uh, you do not need to unroof these lesions. Uh, you just vigorously swab them. And I will say that all the different phases of lesions that I showed on the previous slide, I have swabbed. And if they have monkeypox, they are positive. So don't worry about really, you know, getting it in there or, or unroof or getting some fluid out or anything. If you just vigorously swab, um, it, it, it will be positive. It's a, it's a sensitive enough test. And ideally, you do want to get swabs from multiple lesions. So um, especially if there's different lesions in different stages, um, which, which does happen in these severe cases, uh, you'll want to get them. And um, then these universal transport media swabs need to be um, refrigerated or placed on ice uh, before they're shipped. And obviously, any positive patients VDH needs to know about. Uh, this is a little bit more. This is um, an obligatory slide I actually borrowed from uh, the VDH slide deck, but just to say it out loud, proper PPE is gown, gloves, N95, and uh, eye protection. 
And if you're if you're in the inpatient setting and you're going to be moving patients around, you really want to kind of minimize um, how often you're exposing exposing them to the the rest of the population in the hospital. Um, yeah, and then obviously contact DDH with any positive cases. All right, so what are our countermeasures or treatment options for this? I will start out by saying that most patients, um, this is a self-limited illness that uh, likely won't require um, any special treatment, but what they probably will require is some type of um, pain alleviation, pain management. The more severe cases can go on to get proctitis, gastrointestinal symptoms, and um, either way, you really want to manage. I, I just am addressing up front to manage their pain um, and uh, symptoms as part of this too. Going back to this diagram um, of the viral life cycle, uh, you'll see here that the first thing I'll talk about is VIGIV or vaccinate immunoglobulin, which is just an antibody. Uh, these antibodies are isolated from uh, humans that have. Uh, been vaccinated previously for smallpox specifically and um, purified just the antibody. So it's just like giving any other human antibody infusion. Uh, we have the DNA polymerase inhibitors, sidofovir, brin, sidofovir, trifluoridine, uh, which specifically inhibit this stage of the viral life cycle. And then uh, the most popularized one for this uh, recent outbreak has been TPOX or Ticaviramat, which inhibits the um, viral protein 37 and envelope protein that um, is involved in uh, assembly and budding of the virus too. So we'll just kind of briefly go through each of these. So vaccinia immunoglobulin, um, FDA approved for complications of smallpox vaccination specifically. So, um, you know, historically it's been either laboratory workers or the military that have uh, received this vaccination. Um, however, if somebody gets contaminated or someone who has an, uh, an immunocompromising condition has a complication, uh, that's basically what this was reserved for. Um, it's available through the strategic national stockpile. Uh, when we used it, we had to go through VDH through CDC to acquire it. Um, and there's there's no clinical monkeypox data for effectiveness. Um, many of the regions of, of basically all the proteins are, are conserved, exterior proteins, I should say, uh, between pox viruses. Um, and it does work in vitro to inhibit, uh, neutralize um, these viruses, but there's virtually no uh, clinical monkeypox data for this other than just case reports. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, basically that's recommendation for use is extrapolated from vaccinia data. Sidofovir, Brin Sidofovir. Uh, so Sidofovir is in use currently, uh, primarily for CMV, uh, which inhibits the viral DNA polymerase. Um, but there is in vitro and in vivo data that basically shows it has activity against pox viruses as well, including monkeypox. Um, I should say, I apologize. I probably switched between monkeypox and mpox, so I just I apologize for that. Um, case reports of use in vaccinia. So again, vaccinia is the virus that was used in the ACAM 2000, or it's ACAM 2000 is a descendant of that virus, I should say. And um, any complications of that, that's what it was used for previously. Uh, it is readily available. Every hospital has it. The major downsides are that it is highly nephrotoxic. Uh, which limits its use and there's no PO options. It is available IV and we anecdotally have used it topically in some of the severe cases. Um, I don't know how helpful it was, but uh, bottom line is there's no PO option here. Brin Sidofavir is uh, very similar to Sidofavir. It's the oral pro drug. Uh, so it inhibits, inhibits the same viral DNA polymerase. There's limited data in, the, in this. Uh, there was one case series where every patient that got it it had to be discontinued because they all developed elevated transaminases, um, which is unfortunate. But, uh, and, and again, this also must be requested um, from the CDC. Trifluoridine, uh, it's, it's an eye drop specifically for the treatment of herpes uh, keratoconjunctivitis. And again, there's in vitro evidence that it has activity against the DNA polymerase of pox viruses. Uh, and there are case reports for its use in ocular pox virus infections, uh, specifically in vaccinia. So this is a case where a patient got um, the actual vaccine against smallpox. And I don't know if they got it in their eye or they rubbed their eye after um, after kind of touching the lesion that develops, but they got um, an eye infection with vaccinia and then recovered after using these trifluoridine eye drops too. So, and then there's there's TPOX. So I mentioned it's a uh, 
basically it's a viral protein 37 inhibitor, which is involved in um, assembly and budding. And uh, it's available through uh, the CDC through uh, an expanded access IND, uh, as well as the uh, STOMP trial, which I'll talk about as well. But it's basically it's recommended in the IND that anyone with severe disease, which I will say there is no universal um, agreed upon formal definition of what severe disease is. I will say you probably will recognize it when you see it, but they list hemorrhagic disease, confluent lesions, um, sepsis, encephalitis, eye involvement, or essentially any any reason that the patient's hospitalized for this. Um, also, any sensitive areas that are involved or anatomic areas that could um, become problematic if they were to stretch or scar. That includes things like the urethra, um, the rectum. And then anyone who is at risk for high disease. So that would be anyone with severe immunocompromised, children, pregnant or breastfeeding women, and then patients with uh, conditions affecting skin integrity. There was a question about this in a, in a talk I'd given previously. And basically, um, patients with either eczema or psoriasis or other um, skin conditions that jeopardize the integrity of the skin can actually have uh, much more severe outcomes with pox virus infections, specifically like vaccinia, the smallpox vaccine. Um, so, considerations with TPOX, so uh, just to emphasize again, there's an ongoing clinical trial right now, but there's really no, um, there's no high quality evidence of its efficacy or effectiveness in, in humans with smallpox, or excuse me, monkeypox. Um, so, it's, it's unclear. I will say that, you know, since the beginning and even since I, I put these slides together, there's been more and more a growing body of literature that suggests that it probably does help. Um, but Obviously, the, the randomized control data is lacking. Uh, there's also concern for resistance uh, that could render the drug ineffective for treated patients. So, ticoviramat unfortunately does have a very low barrier to resistance. So, only one amino acid change is required for the virus to actually be resistant to TPOX. Um, fortunately, I will say, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, it, it seems to be a rare occurrence, although it does happen. And lastly, just to mention, it's a oral or IV 14 day course, but in uh, severe cases, this can be extended for much longer periods. So, expanding a little bit more on TPOX resistance, um, there, as I mentioned, there is a low barrier for resistance um, for this virus against TPOX, and uh, so there was some concern early on that there would be wide potential for widespread resistance if we started giving TPOX out. Um, Fortunately, it's been rare, but it has been reported, and uh, there's been a couple instances where patients had resistant uh, virus. Um, but in every case, it's been a patient that's had a very severe immunocompromising condition, had lesions uh, ongoing for a long period of time, and were on very long courses of TPOX, um, TPOX monotherapy, I should, I should point out. Uh, and so, while this is a, a, a theoretical risk, um, it seems to be low, but it is a very possible um, risk. Uh, and so the STOMP trial. So this is the preferred mechanism for TPOX access. Uh, it's, it's the only clinical trial going on in, in the United States. There's a handful of other ones worldwide, but this is the one we have here in the United States. It's run by NIAID um, through the AIDS Clinical Trial Group. And it's basically it's a, it's a clinical trial, randomized controlled trial to evaluate the effectiveness of TPOX. Um, when I left VCU, uh, I left, uh, unfortunately, uh, VCU, to my knowledge, had been the only stop trial site. And initially, they were going to close, but I, I literally just found out yesterday that um, they it's paused right now at VCU, but they're actually, someone else will be picking up the project. So, we actually will have um, a site here in Virginia to enroll patients. Um, and, of course, TPOX is also available through the uh, expanded access IND through the CDC. If for whatever reason, they're either not eligible or willing to enroll in the STOMP trial. I will say, even if even while VCU is uh, paused in enrolling patients, they're enrolling 100% remote. So there's multiple remote sites. I think technically the closest one is in North Carolina from here, um, but the the trial is now being conducted can be conducted 100% remote. Um, they get an overnight um, overnight shipment of the drug or placebo. And everything is done virtually or, or remotely um, to, to enroll patients in the study. Um, so this is just a summary slide. Uh, everything kind of just talked about the uh, TPOX at the top, sodofavir, uh, Vigiv, and Brin-Sodofavir. 
um, and the available formulations uh, for each. I'll say that um, basically we have two PO options and two IV options, PO being TPOX and brinsidofavir, and the IV being sidofavir and vivif. Uh, one thing that is not on here is you can, you can give sidofavir topically, um, and I will just say that that is 100% um, anecdotal, uh, and, uh, and then there's the trifluoridine eye drops as well. So I just wanted to pause there because I'm going to um, talk about some of these more severe cases and, and basically some of the uh, issues that we ran into and, and questions that are still out there and how we think the best way to treat some of these patients is. But uh, I'll stop here for a second if there's any questions. If you have any questions, feel free to come up to the mic. Yeah, and, and feel free to just interrupt me too. Uh, if something pops into your head later too. So, okay. oh, okay, perfect. Yes. Um, so, um, is there any use in doing like a, a oral swab or a rectal anal swab if you don't see a lesion? So, I would say that that would not be indicated, but there has been studies, um, and I think this was one either a question that I, I saw on paper or that came up before. There have been some studies where they actually. Um, retrospectively looked at swabs from patients that had come into SCI clinics and uh, there, there were asymptomatic shedders in like 10% of the rectal swabs that they just took from a random population from an STI clinic. Um, so it is a thing. Don't know how it is contributing to, you know, ongoing spread or anything like that. But I, I would say, I mean, from, from my, I guess, just opinion on it right now. I mean, if, there, if you don't see a lesion, I wouldn't, there's no guidance to start swabbing people asymptomatically right now. Yeah. All right. So, um, so back to our case. So, uh, this patient, uh, just to, just to recap, you know, he had basically been given all the, um, medical countermeasures we have against TPOX and was started uh, on ART. Uh, but, however, his lesions continued to, to worsen and progress, and unfortunately, he ended up dying about 68 days from diagnosis and three weeks after starting ART um, from multi-organ failure. Um, the actual cause of death in this case, and I will say that he, he obviously had genital lesions, he also had rectal and we suspect um, internal gastrointestinal lesions because he was having rectal bleeding as well. Um, he ended up dying of gram-negative sepsis, presumably from a um, translocated bacteria from one of his uh, lesions in his GI tract. This was not a case from VCU. I, I just took this case to highlight. This is one that was published recently, but another um, severely immunosuppressed patient, just to stress how severe these lesions can get. So this patient had a very high viral load, um, very low CD4 count, and uh, progressed uh, over a period of weeks um, to where he had you know, increasing necrotic eschar on his face, um, continued necrosis to where it just literally um, essentially ate through his entire face. And this patient, unfortunately, also ended up passing away as well, um, despite, I should say, multiple uh, measures. So HIV, um, I will say that the well-controlled HIV, all the data seems to suggest that if they're well-controlled, um, then they're, they're going to be fine, just like if you did not have HIV uh, in cases of MPOX infection. However, uncontrolled HIV, uh, the, the data is, is pretty definitive in, definitive in this in that there's more likelihood of a prolonged illness, larger lesions, higher rates of um, secondary infections, uh, and just worse outcomes overall to include um, multi-organ involvement and death. It's just another picture from a published study showing um, kind of se severe necrotic lesions on the face, but also these uh, respiratory, uh, basically pulmonary lesions, so pulmonary MPOX lesions. Uh, and this this is a, a figure that came out of the Lancet that, that was um, essentially a cohort profiling uh, patients with advanced HIV uh, and MPOX. And you'll see uh, just the bottom here is um, CD4 count on the right-hand side, or excuse me, the y-axis is showing the proportion of patients that either died or were admitted to the hospital. And you'll see that once you get under 200, CD4 count of 200, that's when uh, the deaths start occurring uh, more likely to be hospitalized and go to the intensive care unit. Uh, and same thing for viral load over here. Once you get above log four, 
uh, basically all the deaths, uh, MPOX deaths are, are basically in, in patients that had con completely uncontrolled viral loads here. Um, so it's, it's very clear that CD4 T cells are required to clear the virus. This was actually known previously on animal data that, um, for example, monkeys with uh, SIV, um, which is simian immunodeficiency to virus, uh, that got MPOX were completely unable to clear the virus um, and even didn't respond to um, uh, vaccines. And this is borne out clinically in the current outbreak where patients with uncontrolled HIV do not do well. And despite starting all the, the drugs that we have against MPOX, um, continue to not do well. So CD4 count, CD4 cells are critically important to being able to clear the virus. Patients will not recover until they have a CD4 count. Um, there's also a question of iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So a couple of these early reports, uh, including one that we published out of VCU, uh, which I'll come back to, I don't think it's actually the case. Basically, we're suggesting that a lot of these patients actually got worse after starting them on ART, um, right in the two to four week range after starting uh, antiretroviral drugs. Um, Jury's out. We don't know the answer. I will say that, you know, and I was part of that paper, but I will say after having published that and seeing a little bit more that's been come out since then, they actually have done some autopsy and biopsy studies that show that, you know, these patients that get worse or have really severe outcomes, there's really no lymphocytic infiltrate in these patients. They just have full thickness necrosis, and it's all due to viral cyto, um, cytopathology. So, in other words, the virus is killing the cells. And they're just replicating unchecked. There's no lymphocytic infiltration. It's not to say that there's definitely no iris, but that would suggest that there's not. Uh, iris is not the driver for why they deteriorate. Um, also, make the point that while resistance against TPOX is rare, it is still possible. And related to that, there's actually in vitro and in vivo evidence that there's a there's synergy in combining TPOX with brinsidofovir. So all of this to say um, is that this is the CDC guidance doesn't come out and say this, but I will say I'm um, having consulted with them and just our clinical experience was that. I recommend that if patients are severe or seem to be at high risk for developing severe disease that you immediately start them on combined anti uh, viral therapy and I forget forgive me. This is a, a typo here, but so in other words, we combine TPOX. Sidofavir and brinsid or brinsidofavir and Vigiv um, and ART at the earliest possible time, because the idea here is that we need to inhibit the virus as much as we can from replicating and bridge that person until their CD4 count comes up to the point where they're actually able to clear the virus. Um, that's the theory behind it. There's obviously not clinical trial data and there's no universal consensus on this, but the more evidence has come out. Um, suggest to me that in these severe cases, we got to maximally inhibit the virus, bring that CD4 count back up so that patient is eventually able to clear the virus. Uh, this is a diagram kind of explaining the process here. So I think a lot of people don't realize like how long and painful a process this is, but I'll just start here at the top. So patients will get initial infection come in with, um, you know, progressive spread of lesions. They develop multi-organ system uh, involvement, uh, and, and this is months, I should say, on the bottom. So literally, this, this goes on for months. And so our recommendation is that you start um, combination therapy against MPOX, so Sidofavir, Vigiv, and TPOX, unless there's a contraindication, to maximally inhibit the virus and start ART right away, uh, unless, of course, there's some other contraindication, which I will say there's um, a lot of these patients do end up coming in with um, multiple issues, like cryptomeningitis, for example. Um, but the earlier you get that on board, the better, in my opinion, only because there really doesn't seem to be any benefit to delaying ART in these patients from the, the data that's been published. And they are not going to get better until they have a CD4 count that's capable of clearing that virus. Um, and then you wait. So, like I said, you, you see on the bottom here, the axis, and not every patient is going to go this long, but it literally takes months and months. And these, these wounds just fester. They'll get better. They'll get worse. Patients will have fevers. You'll investigate the fever and it just, um, it requires a longitudinal multidisciplinary care team, which includes, you know, wound care nurses, um, uh, you know, some psychiatry, 
sometimes the surgeons, um, obviously infection control, infectious disease, um, uh, internal medicine, because these patients will, will have these and be infectious and sick for months. Um, but then eventually, um, with enough time, their immune system recovers, they're able to clear the virus, you can peel off the combination therapy, obviously keep them on ART, um, and they recover. Um, I'll say this is just a little bit more, obviously other considerations here are that you want to, um, you want to start ART as long as there's not another contraindication. So obviously go to your standard HIV guidelines about uh, other reasons to start uh, ART. And as I mentioned, a lot of times these patients are going to be coming in with either with multiple things. So um, right off the bat, they're going to have HIV and MPOX, but they should also be screened for other STIs as well as other opportunistic infections. I know we've had PCP, pneumonia, and cryptomeningitis on top of MPOX and HIV uh, at VCU. And then there's another study called VirusMap um, that um, basically it's, it's more of a, a clinical course study that the CDC is running to, um, to really understand um, MPOX a little bit more from a clinical standpoint. Uh, and I should mention here, this is the CDC MPOX uh, consult uh, email and phone number that um, they were actually quite helpful in the case, some of the cases that we've had as well. Um, last kind of case I'll show you, and this was our success story, um, where basically he came in about a month into his, um, his a month after his diagnosis, and you can see he's got essentially full thickness necrosis of, you know, his genitals and his face. And th these are just two areas of his body. He had this all over his entire body. And um, literally day 239 is when he recovered his CD4 count enough to actually clear the virus. Um, and uh, this was not surgically debrided. This was just his skin kind of growing back and scarring back over. I will say that um, for his general, he's actually needed to get um, some urologic procedures because he did develop some severe strictures, um, but the skin is actually growing back. Um, and, uh, but this, this lesion here, or the um, kind of beefy red epithelialized lesion here, uh, that still continued to test positive on day 239, um, which obviously was an infection control issue for the operating room, but um, just, just to emphasize how kind of prolonged and severe this can be. And that's it. So um, uh, sorry for the abrupt ending, but I just kind of wanted to end on a somewhat positive note is that he did much better um, and he's, you know, Functional walking, talking, every, everything for the most part has gotten better now. Um, but so we we can make a difference. I don't know it's entirely because of what we did. So there's still a lot of things that we need to understand about the pathogenesis and, and the optimal clinical care of these patients. But at least in my opinion, the best way to do it is to just hit them hard with everything up front, bridge them until they can clear the virus themselves, and just vigilantly have multiple people involved in their care following them throughout the process because it takes a very long time. Um, so with that, that is all I had prepared for this section and happy to answer any questions for that.